Please welcome Dr. Tom Mihaljevic, CEO and President of Cleveland Clinic and the holder of the Morton L. Mandel CEO Chair. Good evening and, and welcome to Ideas for Tomorrow. Ken Frazier is executive chairman of the board of directors of Merck, the renowned pharmaceutical firm. And Ken previously led Merck for a decade as president and chief executive officer before retiring only a year ago. Ken is a trailblazer and a man of principle who champions equity and justice. And you will hear from him when he comes and join us about his truly remarkable life story. How he rose from poor Philadelphia neighborhoods and became a lawyer and then made his unique transition from being uh, an active lawyer to becoming a healthcare uh, pharmaceutical executive. Along the way, he has always followed his conscience and he has always advocated for the rights and dignity of others. Please join me in welcoming Ken Frazier. Ken, official welcome to Cleveland Clinic. We're delighted to have you here, and uh, uh, we had a pretty busy schedule for you earlier today. Absolutely. I was able to go into operating rooms and see, first of all, a very complex operation around someone whose arch needed to be fixed, and then I saw another operation that really hit home for me because a year ago, November 15th, I had uh, triple bypass surgery, so I got to go watch someone uh, have bypass surgery as well as mitral valve uh, surgery, and so it was for me an amazing experience. I don't remember it as well as I saw it today. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we are we are delighted that you allocated some time here to visit us, and uh, we really very much look forward to the, to the conversation. Thank you. And uh, you know, you you have an absolutely fascinating background, and just for for all of us. Our backgrounds really, in, in a large measure, shape us, who we are as people and uh, what we do for the rest of, rest of your life. Tell us a little bit more uh, about your family. You come from a very, very large, large family. You're yes. born and raised in Philadelphia. Tell us a little bit more uh, about how your background shaped you. So I'll start by saying I feel very fortunate um, to have been born in a family with a mother and father who had extremely high standards and extremely high belief in what their children could achieve. Um, my mother died when I was 12 and I was raised by a single parent father who was not sentimental about his children. He was both <laughs> tough and tender at the same time, which I think is a really important aspect of being a leader. Um, my father was an unusual human being if he were alive today, my dad would be 122 years old. He was 54 when I was born. My paternal grandfather, Richard Frazier, was born in 1857. So there's only one generation between me and slavery. And that was a big part of my upbringing. My dad used to sit at the dinner table and tell us about being born in this country, about being born in South Carolina, he lived his entire life in you know, great um, admiration and thankfulness to his father, who was illiterate, but sent him north before he reached the age of majority so that my father didn't become a sharecropper like his father. So my father was a janitor, had a third grade education, or would pass for three years of education for a black child between 1906 and 1909, but I can tell you his habits of dress and speech and behavior were immaculate. He was self-taught. He read two newspapers a day. And we would have to sit at the dinner table and hear story after story about his hero, Jackie Robinson. <laughs> okay? And the point of Jackie Robinson's stories were twofold. First of all, Jackie was an exemplar of excellence to my father. And my father's view was that we needed to see this shining example of excellence. But the other thing was, my dad said, you know, when I was 47 and for the first time I saw Jackie Robinson on the playing field, 
I knew that anything was possible for my children because America had changed. And then, of course, as this, the film says, I was born in the same year as Brown versus Board of Education, which opened educational doors for me. So I guess that's a little bit about my upbringing in the inner city of Philadelphia. The other thing I'll say about my, my dad is that he just demanded that everybody needed to take advantage of the opportunities. But my opportunities were different from my siblings. Yeah. Yeah, so let's just speak a little bit about that because you're, yeah. you're one of the youngest children. Eight, uh, I'm eight of nine. Eight of nine. And, uh, and you are fortunate. Yes. Very, very fortunate uh, to enjoy some of the privileges that unfortunately your oldest siblings couldn't. Tell yes. us a little bit more about that. So as I said, I'm the eighth of my dad's nine children. Um, my younger sister and I came along in the birth order at a time when the social engineers in Philadelphia engaged in what they then called school desegregation, which is very different from integration. It's the idea that the best schools in Philadelphia shouldn't be all white. And so my younger sister and I were two little black kids who were put on buses and sent across town. I felt like a stranger in a strange land, let me tell you. I was so resentful because unlike my siblings, I couldn't go to the neighborhood school. I couldn't hang out with my friends on the way to school and back because they would walk in back and forth to school. I had to take a bus and a subway and another bus. Uh, but looking back on that, I know without equivocation that the different quality of the education that I got by riding that bus 90 minutes is the only reason I can be sitting in front of you and talking today. And so for me, this is my responsibility is to tell my story and explain why I feel very much like sort of an imposter because if I had not been in that situation in the birth order, my parents could not afford real estate that was proximate to where the good schools were and my life would have been very different and it should not be that way in this country. Yeah. So now obviously you took a full advantage of your of your educational uh, opportunities yet, you know, it, we kind of briefly mentioned you went to Harvard Law School. I'm sure that it I got over for, it though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how, how was it to get in? I, I, when I think about the the professions that were that were open to African Americans, to minorities, and uh, you know, the parts of our higher educational system that was probably more inclusive, it, it seems to me that law schools kind of were early trailblazers in that yes, openness. Absolutely. What's, what's your take on it? Why is that so? Because we continue to seek that type of openness in other parts of our society. And it seems to me that even elite law schools have embraced the diversity early on. I think that's right. I think maybe it is because I think lawyers see themselves as guardian of our, guardians of our sacred creeds as a country, of which one of which is sort of equal justice under the law. Yeah. And the concept that if we're going to have equal justice under law, that you have to have exposure and opportunity for everyone. I mean, I'm sort of making it up as I go along, but it is true that I think the law has been a place where African Americans could make a living. And then of course, you know, way before Martin Luther King became the leader of the civil rights movement that we all know, the, the sit-ins and the things that happened after that, Thurgood Marshall going back to the 1930s was bringing case after case challenging restrictive racial covenants in real estate and then challenging uh, separate but equal as it related to professional schools in Texas and Oklahoma, and all of that led through a series of cases. It culminated with Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954. Yeah. So, so you, your early path, if you're going to start the same chronological order, is reflective of your passion for justice. I think justice maybe in that's the United true. States. Yeah, I went to I went to law school. I didn't I didn't know that lawyers represented big companies like Merck and represent were big law firms. I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. That's, that was, Thurgood Marshall was my hero, and I wanted to be like him, and that's why I went to, to law school. I got to Harvard Law School, and I learned that there was a whole different side to the practice of law, representing large companies and institutions, and it helped you pay off your student loans. <laughs> and uh, and that, I went in that direction, although I was fortunate to go work for a, a firm that did a lot of civil rights work. Yeah. 
Just share, share for, for, for our audience, please, the, the case that is closest to your heart, the one that, that is uh, frequently mentioned uh, when your name is mentioned, and I think it was very, very influential back in the days. So, um, I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer, and there's no place in the world where there's a need for lawyers more than in the, in the pr jurisprudence of the death penalty in our country. You know, I don't want to lecture people about the moral issue around the death penalty. You can be for it or against it as a matter of abolition, but I will say this. I do think that if we're going to have a death penalty, it will require of our democracy a level of precision and justice that the current system is designed not to produce. So the case that I had represented Bo Cochran, who you heard about, he was on the road for 19 years for a homicide he absolutely did not commit. Um, he was represented by a lawyer in Alabama who was court appointed. He was paid $500 for the entire representation, which is nothing for something as complicated as this. I won't bore you with all the facts of the case, but this was a gunshot murder case. Uh, when I first met Mo, he was, uh, Bo, he was 13 days before his scheduled execution date in Alabama when I took the case. I went to meet him, and uh, the first thing he said to me is, everybody in the prison knows what happened on that particular night, that it was a mistaken shooting by a police officer. And I'm thinking to myself, I had done enough criminal law to, to realize that, you know, frankly, there were no guilty people in jail, right? They're all innocent, right? And uh, it went in one ear and out the other ear, I was determined to make sure that he was properly represented. But after investigating the case for many years, I found a few facts out. I won't bore you with all the facts. But in a gunshot murder case, there's a battery of standard forensic tests that's always done. You always test the hands of the person to see a paraffin test to see if the gun's discharged. You always test the barrel of the gun to see if it was discharged. You always test the barrel of the gun to see if fingerprints are there. And then lastly, you try to match the bullet to the actual gun. In this case, although those are the four standard forensic tests, the state of Alabama did only one test, and the bullet didn't match his gun, and they stopped. I'll also point out that the circumstances of his case, this was after a robbery had occurred somewhere else. Even if the state had proven the case, the facts that they proved under Alabama law, that case would not have been death eligible because he was convicted of the crime where you shoot victims purposefully to keep them from identifying you. And under the, under the state's theory of the case and under the facts, he was nowhere near the robbery. And so at the most, they would say if they thought he was the robber, he was fleeing from the robbery. And under the law, that would not have been death eligible. So all of that is true, but he was not well represented. So some of you have read the Kafka novel where the trial, where the defendant has a lawyer who says, you need to accept your guilt. And it doesn't matter whether you did it or not. Well, this was Kafka-esque. And uh, yeah. it really goes to show that in our system, people really do need representation by lawyers. Because I will say that when we got into the case, we were able to find people who were eyewitnesses to the event who actually exculpated my client. He spent 19 years on the row. On retrial, the jury was out for less than one hour to acquit him because there was no evidence. I took too long to tell you that. I simply say that, you know, frankly, as I started, if we're going to have a death penalty, it would require a system that does not prove, does not produce as many false positives as our current system produces. You may know that the Innocence Project has now exculpated over 100 people from in these cases. And those are generally rape murder cases where DNA exculpates people. Uh, so just think how many people are under sentence of death for crimes they didn't commit. Well, thank you for, for sharing this story with us. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's what, is, what is fascinating about your biography is that you were so deeply immersed in uh, and civil rights movement by being, by being a lawyer. And then you happen to make this turn into pharmaceutical industry, not intuitive. Uh, 
uh, aside from finding a way to pay your bills, what else attracted you to, to, uh, to join Merck? So I was in a law firm where, in addition to doing civil rights work on the side, um, I had to, of course, pay my bills, and I, and I represented a number of companies, Merck being chief among them. And the CEO of Merck, a great CEO named Roy Vagelos, called me in 1992 and said, frankly, uh, I'm going to step down in three years, and I have only en enough time to make one person's career, and it's going to be your career, uh, which was amazing. And he called me into his office, and he offered me a job as one of the top lawyers in the com company. I went home and I told my wife, I've got to be polite and figure out a nice way to tell Dr. Vagelis that I'm not really going to come. <laughs> I say that because I loved jury trial work. I can tell you there's nothing more exciting than jury trial work. You know, you ain't roll your eyes about just a lawyer, but you know, they, Hollywood has certain things that they go to. Their go-to things are firemen stories, cop stories, doctor stories, emergency room stories, and courtroom stories. And I love trying cases to juries. Uh, so I wasn't going to do this, but my wife was a legal headhunter at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, I know you love being a partner in a law firm, but it's sort of a cruel hoax. And there's this stuff called stock options at companies. Like <laughs> and you may want to try that out. And so I went there. Um, and, and the other thing that I really must say, though, is there is a strong mission in a place like Merck that is not unlike the mission of the Cleveland Clinic. And the reason I was a civil rights lawyer is because I felt like I was making a contribution to society. And, and Merck is no ordinary place like the Cleveland Clinic. And the people at Merck get up every day with the mission of alleviating human suffering and extending lives and improving lives. And that felt very much like the mission that I had becoming a lawyer. So I spent 10 years trying to save one death row person's lives. Uh, with the work we can do, of course, we can save millions of lives. Yeah. So what was the learning curve for you, you know, getting from a legal profession into a completely new industry? Uh, how, how, did you, how did you manage to, to, so to say, find your sea legs with different vocabulary, right. different colleagues, different people? So now I'm going to give you a confession, right? When I came along, no one knew how to diagnose ADD. But I suffer from ADD. And one of the reasons I became a jury trial lawyer is I could never get involved enough to be a tax lawyer or a corporate lawyer where you had to really know something about the law, <laughs> OK? The great thing about jury trial lawyers is they're storytellers. And even though I didn't know a lot about the law, I always knew more than the jury knew about the law. So frankly, when I got to Merck, what I realized was that this was like going back to school. I liked learning new things. I liked moving on. My attention span was very short for repetitive stuff. And so I was, you know, frankly, how can I say this? Uh, Merck is composed of really, really talented people who, have, who are very deep often in a very narrow area. And I was given responsibility very early on where I could do, know a, a, a lot about a little rather than, I meant a little about a lot rather than a lot about a little. And I found that that was fascinating. So I, I loved going in there and learning how business worked. And by the way, I also can say, as their different CEOs have different skill sets and I never felt like I was very strong financially orient, orient, in orientation or very operationally in my orientation. I was always much more of a leader who really wanted to keep alive the spirit of the company and keep up the morale of the company. I mean, I'm a lawyer running a scientific company, and you know, I can't tell the difference between a peptide or a protein. Uh, and so the only way that I could do that job, frankly, uh, was to try to create an environment where really good science could happen. I was never going to do it. Uh, but I, I learned, as I mentioned, I worked for Roy Vagelos, for, who's a phenomenal CEO. I was his apprentice for two and a half years, and I watched how he did the job. And on my best day, I'm simply imitating Roy Vagelos, because I had proximity to him. 
I love this definition of CEO's job, knowing a uh, little about a lot of things. So <laughs> that's, that's probably accurate. Uh, just reflecting on it for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, uh, so, but it's, it, is, it, is, it is still a challenge. What I find out is, is to, to get your, so to say, a street cred. Yes, that was hard. Uh, street cred uh, among people who, you know, clearly have a different profile, who have immersed de themselves deep, deep into science, in this case, in, in, in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, how did you navigate that? How did you actually get them to to listen to you, to, uh, to really take, take somebody with completely seriously. different contractual series. Right. So that wasn't easy, obviously. Um, I've been at Merck 31 years. I spent seven of those 31 years outside the, inside the legal department and 24 outside the legal yeah. department. But they still say you're the lawyer, right? right. So it's, I still have to deal with that, that sort of conception. And I, when they say you're a lawyer, I always say, but not in a pejorative sense of the word. Uh, so from my perspective, it was really learning from the scientists. Uh, by the way, I was a chemistry major before I went to law school, so it helped a little bit. Um, learning from the engineers, learning from the finance people, learning from everyone inside the company. And I think, again, what I was saying is that a lot of organizations are knowledge-oriented, but you know, you can be a knowledge organization, or you can be a learning organization. And I didn't have a lot of deep knowledge in a lot of areas, but I really did try to learn a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that helped after a period of time. Yeah. Now that, that's, that's for sure. I mean, nobody can master, obviously, uh, so, so many different topics in, in a complex company like Merck uh, with, uh, with a great depth. But there's another part that, is intriguing for me because you mentioned culture. Oh, yeah. uh, when you came to Merck for the, for the first time, did you get a sense for that culture right, out of, right at the start or did it come later? So absolutely, and I didn't tell you um, so how my first interaction with Merck, I skipped a bunch of grades and I became a lawyer at a very young age. Yeah. And so I was a 23 year old first year lawyer and the partners in my law firm got together and decided that I, they couldn't pass me off as a real lawyer. <laughs> and uh, they had a lot of cases for Merck, vaccine cases, before we had a, an administrative remedy for vaccine injuries. And there's a really great scientist. He's actually got an exhibit to himself in the, in the Smithsonian. His name was Maurice Hilleman. And he's the inventor of many of the childhood vaccines that we use in this country today. When he died, his obituary was on the first page, front page of the New York Times. And it said he'd saved more lives than any scientist who'd lived in the 20th century, and yet he's not well known. In any event, Dr. Hillman would always be called in these cases by the plaintiff's lawyers just to, basically to annoy him. Um, and I got the, the job of following him around in cases, basically to take care of his creature comforts get him Coke and, pep and pep potato chips. And he was really a giant. He was a scientific giant. And so being on the road with him and getting to know him, I learned what science was about. And I learned about what Merck was really about. And so I guess I've always been one who drinks the Kool-Aid about what a company like Merck can do. Yeah. I'm not naive. I know there are challenges around drug pricing and things like that. But at the core, what these companies can do to extend human life, working in conjunction with people like people yeah. here at the Cleveland Clinic, is just an amazing thing. Yeah. And I just always believed that. And but still, as a CEO, obviously, you also, aside from leading the company in, their, in the company's day-to-day -day work, you have to make a few big bets. Yes. Yes. Which were the ones that you made? How, do you, how did you make okay. them? So I said I was in a job for almost 11 years. I only had to make five decisions in 11 years. Okay. By the way, I, I should have mentioned, I ran marketing and sales for four years before becoming CEO. So I did have an opportunity globally to understand the customer side of the business and work with physicians. But I only had to make five decisions in those years. 
The first and most significant decision was when I took over in 2011, it was commonly said by Wall Street that the way in which you created value in a pharmaceutical company was to cut your R&D budget and to invest in non-pharmaceutical assets. So people had given up on R&D. Because if you looked in the rear view mirror for the preceding decade or so, there hadn't been any real important breakthroughs in the industry. Now what most people don't understand about our industry is that really important breakthroughs, transformational medicines, happen only sporadically and they're spread out. So if you're a person who actually wants to get something delivered every other year, you should probably get in the software business. You should not be in the pharmaceutical business because you know, my daughter used to work for Google. She's now got her own company, but she would tell us how wonderful and innovative Google was. And when I wanted to annoy her, I would say, I get that. But at Merck, we do a form of innovation that's really hard. It's called invention, <laughs> OK? We're not doing a better algorithm to make the search work a little faster and to make the ads a little bit more worthwhile. I'm not knocking it. I'm simply saying inventing new drugs is very hard. We fail more than 90% of the time. You know, and when we do succeed, most of those successes don't earn back their cost of capital. So when I'm, you know, I'm down on the hill and people are saying to me, why do you charge so much for this cancer drug that you have Keytruda? I always say to them, you can't have winners if you can't pay for lots of losers. And so ultimately, what I feel about the industry and what I learned about the industry was that I had to stay with the R&D budget mm -hmm. when the investors didn't like it. So when other companies were cutting their budget they, as a new CEO, I announced, uh, I guess Merck had five-year guidance, of which three years EPS guidance remaining. Yeah. So 25 days into the job, I called my board and said, I'd like to suspend that guidance because implicit in that guidance was that we had to make rather large, indiscriminate cuts in the R&D budget. And once you do that, you can never go backwards and say, we're really about R&D. You can never look your scientists in the eye and say, I'm really committed to science, if they see that you're really committed to Wall Street. So that was the hardest decision. The stock went way down. It didn't feel like a lot of fun. But two things happened as a result of that. First of all, you talked about street cred. Yeah. I think the scientist said he cares more about us than he cares about his own image. That helped a little bit. And the second thing is when the stock went down, what was really happening was the people who were looking for short-term gain were selling, and the people who believed in what the company were about were buying. So while it was painful, I ended up with the right shareholder base because they heard me say, if you invest in Merck, we're going to do R&D. We're going to take capital, we're going to invest it in cutting-edge science, and we're going to try to translate that into medicines that make a real difference in the world. So uh, with uh, obviously a, a great, great success of Merck, you also had a, a few trials where the company was not nearly as successful as you desired it to be. COVID I mean, is an example. COVID is an example. So yeah, there, were, there was an unprecedented degree of collaborations against companies that were usually being viewed as competitors, yes. fierce competitors. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about how COVID has changed the business practices? Yeah, so it's happened before. I remember back when I first joined the, uh, the company, we were working on HIV at a time when HIV was a death sentence. And people forget that you know there were a few medicines, one of which was called Crixivan by Merck, which was the first one when added to standard of care, made HIV a chronic manageable disease. But companies work together and share their information. I think the same was true around COVID. Um, you know, everybody knew that the industry had to come up with vaccines and if we're gonna ever come back to sort of sense of normalcy, I think different people employed the vaccine models that they were most familiar with. Um, Merck was unsuccessful with our vaccines, um, but you know, Johnson & Johnson didn't have a supply chain, and they called us up and they said, uh, would you use your manufacturing capabilities to produce Johnson & Johnson vaccines, which of course in the United States, we only use them as a vaccine of last resort because of the thrombotic issues, but they've sold, you know, 
50 million doses around the world, and they've actually saved a lot of lives outside the United States. So that was a collaboration. I have to say, you had to get past the pride of Merck in order to do that, because we don't think of ourselves as contract manufacturers for other people, but you gotta do what's right for society. So let's just speak about what's right for society. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, you, in your, in your capacity as a very prominent leader of a very prominent company, have, you have extended your responsibility, uh, responsibilities beyond your executive usual responsibilities in trying to do what is right for the society. So one of the initiatives that you started is 110. Can you tell us a little bit more about 110? We are obviously delighted to participate uh, in, the, in, this, uh, in this very important initiative, but uh, I, I assume that some of our uh, listeners here uh, may not be as familiar with it. So 110 is a coalition of about 73 leading organizations, mostly companies, but also places like the Cleveland Clinic that are in the nonprofit sphere that are committed to the mission of 110, which is to hire one million African Americans who lack four-year degrees into family-sustaining wage jobs. If you go back to the 2020 census, 76% of African Americans in this country do not have a four-year degree. And many companies require for all kinds of jobs four-year degrees, when in fact, they ought to be skills-based jobs. Now, obviously, at a company like Merck, we have a lot of MDs and MD-PhDs in our labs, and we're not talking about those jobs. But they're jobs in the laboratories, for example, lab techs, where people can learn those skills and be trained. And I think that's one of the challenges that we have as a country. You know, I mentioned that I was the son of a janitor. But in the 50s and 60s when I was coming along, my father, who was a janitor, who had a rather menial job at United Parcel Service, he was paid a family-sustaining wage. He had a lot of children. He could pay his mortgage every month. He could drive a used Buick Electra 225, which he was very proud of. <laughs> because the company felt that all of its employees should be taken care of to at least a standard where they could raise their families. I saw in the New York Times recently that if you make minimum wage in New York City, you have to work 120 hours to be able to pay for a one bedroom apartment. So one of the challenges that we have and that we actually organized around 110 was let's get these companies to re-examine the jobs they have and ask which jobs really do require the credential and which jobs actually require a set of skills. If you look at where our country is, we have a labor shortage, about 11 million unfilled jobs. And it's not like we're growing the population between 30 and 64. So if we can't figure out how to train Americans to do jobs, I don't know how we're ever going to fulfill them. And then there's this other big issue that we have in our country, which is this huge gap that we have I call it the, um, we're a country that has under-inclusive prosperity. We're the most prosperous country in the world. But we have to ask ourselves, how much income inequality are we prepared to have if we want to be a stable society going forward? And so 110 was really about giving people an opportunity uh, to have a bridge into the middle class because we want companies to hire them based on skills. Now the challenge is, companies will often say, now you're lowering the standards. But you know, it's very interesting. I, I, I use my 27-year-old my son as an example. I shouldn't do that. He's a great kid. But we paid a lot of money for him to get a college education. And he got a degree in political science, which equipped him to do nothing, <laughs> okay? But we were not prepared to let him do nothing. So we said, go get a job. So he's now in New York City. He sells luxury real estate for a luxury real estate company. He went there. He had to become an apprentice. He had to learn the business. He had to then take the New York State real estate exam. And now he's a real estate broker. My only point is, 
They would never have given him that opportunity if he didn't have a degree in political science, which was irrelevant to what he ultimately learned to do. <laughs> my other quick story, very quickly, I won't bore sure. you with this, is I told you my dad was a janitor at UPS. UPS was a family-oriented company. So when I was in college, they hired me to be a supervisor on the packing wall for trucks. And it was embarrassing because the guys who packed trucks knew how to pack trucks, and I didn't. <laughs> But they wanted me because I was a college boy. And I realized just how manifestly unfair that was to people who'd spent their whole lives packing trucks, that they couldn't be a first line supervisor because someone thought you had to go to college to do that. So the point of 110, and I'll stop here, you'll forgive me, because no. I get very emotional about this. No. <laughs> I talked about being bused to school. What that gave me as a life opportunity was because I had to get up early and, and get on the bus to go across town. In our little humble house, I would follow my father into the bathroom every morning. My father would be the first one into the bathroom. I would be the second one. We only had one bathroom in our little row house in North Philly. The enduring memory of my life is the smell of my father's shaving cream every morning because he got up, he shaved, he dressed, he went down the stairs, and he went to work, and he took care of his family, and he had dignity. And so I believe most of us have tape recorders in our heads. So if you're a child and you see your parents having dignity and having the value of work and being able to hold their heads up high, that gives you a life opportunity that you don't have if your parents don't work and don't have that sense of accomplishment and dignity. Uh, there's a, and I think that's why we're trying to do 110. I'm yeah. sorry. And I, can I just say that I'm thankful to Cleveland Clinic and to you because we, Cleveland Clinic is one of the stars in our program. The willingness to go out into the community here and give people an opportunity, it's an amazing thing. And I just want to thank you for it. Yeah. Thank you. We're honored to participate. We're honored to, 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 to make a difference. And before I open it for, for the audience, I have to ask parental advice. Okay. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. This is, this is, this, I'm, I'm very serious. One of, the, one of the challenges, I think, for every parent who had experiences such as yours is to share that life's perspective with your children. Mm -hmm. How do you teach perspective? Because if you start your sentence, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't have everything that you used to have, and they roll their eyes and right. this, and you know, and they start checking their, their, right. their messages. Uh, in your experience, now this is not just a parental advice, it is also an advice how to influence people around mm -hmm. you. Uh, because what you sincerely want is people not to go through the hardships that you had to go through, and you wish your children, obviously, a uh, better future and easy, easier, easier path in life. How do, you, how do you teach that? You know, I how wish I had an that? answer to that. I have two kids. My daughter, my oldest daughter, I didn't have to teach her. Somehow she just always saw that and pursued it. Uh, my, my youngest son, I always say, he's the boy whose mother really loves him. <laughs> <laughs> And that's his image in life. <laughs> so no matter what I say, you know, you're not mom. And my mother loves me. <laughs> no, actually, this is, it is really hard to sometimes, when children are growing up in a more affluent life, to sort of give them a sense of their responsibility to themselves and to others. Uh, but I sometimes say, and I don't say this for effect, I used to say to my wife when the children were younger, if we, if we knew we were going to die in an airplane crash and I had the choice of sending my kids back to my old neighborhood but with parents who actually had values or some of our neighbors who seemed to have no values, I'd send them to, to parents who didn't have the economic wherewithal but had the right values. With that, thank you very much and I'll open it for questions. Thank you, Mr. Frazier, for being here and for all you're doing. 
Um, you know, last week I think there was uh, arguments in front of the U.S. Supreme Court around uh, whether race should be considered in college admission. And now that I know you like being a trial lawyer, what would be your closing arguments in front of the justices? Yeah, that's actually a wonderful first question. Um, it's a hard question. Let me just take a step back and say one of the major challenges in our democracy, and it's been here from the time we started, is how do we incentivize and reward achievement and success while also providing equal opportunity? Those two things, sometimes in the argument that's being made, they're being posed as inconsistent. I happen to think they're consistent and complementary. So to answer your question, first of all, I will make the point that I, I always think that when people argue about merit, the question becomes how narrow is your conception of merit, right? So if you read the trial transcript in that case, the plaintiffs in that case conflate test scores with merit. In other words, the higher your test score, the more merit you have. That's not necessarily the only conception of merit that's possible. Um, the fact of the matter is, it depends on where people are from, you know, uh, what their experience in life is, whether they had tutors, et cetera, et cetera, as to whether they actually get to that test score. So I think the challenge I think that this court has to reach is that we've got 50 years of jurisprudence that says that diversity is a valid goal. And that's not just an issue for academia, it's an, it's an issue for military, it's an issue for business. And I would say, without getting to the specifics of what an individual um, university does, I happen to believe that it is disingenuous to say that universities should aim for diversity with the exception of the one thing we have struggled with from the beginning of this country, which is the exclusion of blacks from the mainstream. So to say that we can have regional diversity, et cetera, but we can't have uh, diversity based on race, even though I understand how people look at the 14th Amendment and other things and say that they're colorblind. Actually, I think, again, it's disingenuous. The 14th Amendment, which this case is about in some ways, the Equal Protection Clause, was a issue around post-slavery and Reconstruction. And so I think that for some, at some level, it's important not to preclude businesses from continuing to have people who look like the communities around them. So, but it's not an easy issue, but I, I come down on the side, depending again on how the university actually employs this, I don't think it's the right thing for our country to say, diversity is fine as long as you don't take race into consideration. Thank you. Next question. Um, Mr. Frazier, uh, my, I was at a legal conference uh, this weekend uh, where they had a panel that consisted of two, uh, two Fortune 500 GCs from healthcare companies. And the question was posed in terms of what can a director or a manager of a large publicly traded company say about ESG issues and issues of current interest. And um, both, at least one of the GCs said you have to be very careful in terms of how you respond to those questions. But then he also mentioned your name, and he said, uh, notwithstanding, Ken Frazier seems to be very successful. He, he speaks his mind, and he is able to get away with it. But he said he wouldn't, <laughs> advise, <laughs> he, he wouldn't advise others, uh, including his uh, CEO and board member, to speak their mind like Ken Frazier does. So let me ask you, how do you get, a, get away with speaking your mind and saying what is right and wrong, and why do you think other uh, CEOs and directors can't speak their mind? So no one gave me permission, you know, to speak my mind. You know, I've shared with you my upbringing. I feel an obligation. I'm one, I was one of five African-American CEOs. So you might know, for example, the Trump situation and, and stepping off the president's uh, uh, business council after Charlottesville. 
A lot of my colleagues thought that was the wrong thing to do. But it was my feeling that it was my sense of purpose and my own sense of values. So I will just try to answer your question by saying the following. I understand why CEOs don't want to get in the middle of political disputes. I don't get up in the morning looking to get into political disputes. But I happen to believe that for businesses to be successful, there has to be a climate that is conducive both to commerce and to people. And that climate includes some of the fundamental things that we say we believe in as a country. Fairness, equality, as that last question just said, equal opportunity, equal justice in front of the law, respect for private property, respect for the franchise, the right to vote, in which I got involved in. I, I just don't understand why CEOs can't speak out and say Americans should all be able to vote without interference. My view is that when government officials either abandon or fail at those basic responsibilities that we were taught as children make us American, that citizens need to stand up. And I think CEOs are among the most influential citizens. So I think we have an obligation to speak up. I think our companies exist with a social license from society. And you can't talk about everything because that's not productive. But if it goes to a principle that your company believes in, that our country is based on, and that you believe in. And for me, the issues were always things like Charlottesville or right to vote. You know, I've, we, we put out a statement about right to vote, which was hard. We got 700 people to eventually sign at CEOs. It was hard as hell to get CEOs to sign an anodyne statement that simply said that in this country, people should have a right to vote without undue inter interference because they didn't want to be criticized as being woke CEOs. That's the phrase that gets thrown around, right? You're a woke CEO. And I don't want to be accused of being a woke CEO, but you know what's worse? Being an asleep CEO. <laughs> Last question. Hello, Mr. Frazier. Thank you very much. Um, I do want to say that I share many of your, uh, your history, and so I feel a special kinship uh, towards you, even not knowing you personally. So thank you for sharing your story. It is mine as well. Uh, my question is uh, your vision. So your vision for 110 is phenomenal, and it will be successful. What's the next step? It sounds like it's the first step of many, I'm very curious about your vision for, as you are successful with 110, what comes next? Well, well, that's a great question, and it's an important question, and I'm not going to answer it. Because, <laughs> because deciding that we're going to try to fix this issue of exposure. By the way, I often say to people, when we break down barriers like this one, the, the the requirement of a four-year degree in order to get an entry-level job, a family-sustaining job, happens to disproportionately affect African Americans because 76% 76 of, 76 of African Americans don't have a four-year degree, but something like 50% of white Americans don't have a four-year degree. And it's like when you walk through downtown Manhattan and you see because we've made as a, as a society an attempt to provide people in wheelchairs access, they now have cutouts on the curb for people who are handicapped. If you stand on that corner, watch who uses it. It's able-bodied people with strollers, baby strollers, and pulling luggage. Every time we eliminate a barrier for one group in this society, we eliminate it for everyone. And I think it's really important to recognize that while one, it's just like the civil rights movement, Dr. King opened the doors. People think he was a black leader. If you look at how much our society opened, inclusion is something that's important for all of us. I, I make this speech because I know, and I'll come back to this, I'm only here because someone decided to give me an opportunity. And I happen to believe that I'm not that special. I grew up in the ghetto. I'm not that special. I was just one of those kids who got an unusual opportunity. So, I believe that talent is much more evenly distributed in our society than opportunity is. And I happen to think that we have to ask ourselves, 
morally as a country, how much inequality can we tolerate and be the country we say we want to be? So thank you very much, Canada. There is, something, there is something that I haven't mentioned to you, but in preparation for your arrival, I spoke with somebody who's been, who'd been working with you for many, many years. And he told me something very, very interesting. He asked me, you know, what's, what's Ken like? He told me, you know, Tom, there is, uh, Ken and I would speak every day. And he would come to me, to my office, and talk to me, and that conversation was the most important, the most uplifting, and uh, uh, most precious experiences for that day and every day of my life uh, uh, at Merck. And now we all learned why. So thank you very much for sharing thank it you. with me. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you very much. This is the end of our program with Ken Frazier and our upcoming speaker is Larry Culp who will join in us on November 29th. Larry Culp is the CEO of General Electric. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you again. <laughs>